Good afternoon. I'm Kathy Minden, a member of East Multnomah County League of Women Voters, including the communities of Corbett, Wood Village, Trotdale, Fairview, and Gresham. Today, our guest speakers are, from my left, Multnomah County Sheriff Dan Staten, Chief Ken Johnson of Fairview, and also on my right is Chief Scott Anderson of Trotnail and Chief Craig Juninger of Gresham. It is said there is nothing more constant than change, but it seems we are all presently trying to keep up with change across many facets, communications, community and social networks, technological, to name just a few of them. We realize today's emphasis on law enforcement updates in our East County communities in Multnomah County deserve at least an hour each. So let's get started. And we'll start with Sheriff Staten on my left. Thank you very much. <clears throat> the, uh, I guess to start, let's, let's talk about the Multnomah County Sheriff's Office for a moment. The Sheriff's Office is responsible for supporting all of the local law enforcement agencies and also the unincorporated areas of Multnomah County. And we are a full service agency. <clears throat> now we offer many things that most law enforcement agencies don't have, but the law enforcement functions are equal to our local partners. Now the Sheriff's Office now in East Multnomah County, we have patrol services in the unincorporated areas. We also provide patrol services to our contract cities in East Multnomah County, which would be Wood Village, and then there's Maywood Park as well. We have deputies and supervisors that work these areas. We have school resource officers, community resource officer in place. Uh, some of the services that we provide, we interact very well with our citizens groups. We've started a community-based patrol function in East Multnomah County. Our citizens go out, they provide this service under the direction of the Chief Deputy of Law Enforcement, and then we have a deputy that's assigned as the community service liaison to Corbett and Springdale. And he manages this group, they go out, they patrol, they look for things like people out trying to commit residential burglaries, car prowls at most of our recreational areas up the gorge, they also support some of the city functions if necessary. We have a search and rescue group, which I'm very proud of. The search and rescue group supports the cities, but they also support us when we have lost hikers, people that are injured on the trailheads. They provide additional functions if we have patients that walk away from care facilities and they, they get lost. We support the cities on trying to locate these individuals, and we do this up the gorge. They also support the waterways up the gorge. They do trailhead cleanups up the gorge. So this is one of the services. We have our detectives that are working that, that enforce and support our patrol, patrol functions by conducting the investigations. We have drug enforcement. We have a warrant strike team. And you may ask, why do we have a warrant strike team? Well, one of the reasons why we formed a warrant strike team is because we have right now over 13,000 felony warrants on file for people in Multnomah County alone. That doesn't include the warrants that are on file for those that have committed misdemeanor crimes. So we have that particular function in place as well. And then we have our river patrol. The river patrol covers 101 miles of waterway currently. That includes the Columbia Gorge heading out into East County and also the Sandy River. And it also, the, the tributaries, lakes in East County, they also support that. We have a dive team. They, they conduct several things. They go out and they do underwater investigations for us. They're, they're experts in that function and I'm amazed at what they can do when it comes to locating something underwater. Uh, some of the other functions is they remove hazardous materials from our waterways, debris from our waterways, they do inspections, they support the cities that have these waterways within their jurisdictional boundaries and if you get 
lost, people that are lost along the waterway, someone that's stranded on the waterway, uh, anybody that, that needs assistance on the waterway, we support both the Gresham Fire Bureau and that, that matter and also the police services in those locations. But the Sheriff's Office has got a, a vast array. We have ha hazardous material individuals that are trained to respond. They respond with the Gresham Fire Department if you've got a hazardous material spill. They also investigate drug labs. Now this is regional, it's not just for East Multnomah County, it's up the gorge, they support Hood River in these areas, they support certain segments of Clackamas County and also the city of Portland on that. So the functions that we provide, obviously we provide the law enforcement functions for the unincorporated areas, but we partner very closely with our city partners. The three gentlemen sitting next to me, we partner very well. We have different types of agreements, but in all, when we look at our line staff and they're servicing the communities out there, the cities, the unincorporated areas, our key function is to ensure that the public is safe. And our line staff work towards that function. And when I talk about line staff, I'm talking about the sergeants you see on the road and the officers and the deputies that you see on the road. We're there to support the citizens. We're there to protect the citizens and to look out for your needs. And also, there isn't one of us that sits up here that doesn't, doesn't go out and interact with the community so that we can find out what the services are that you're looking for. Because as a sheriff, one of the things that I focus on is that each community in Multnomah County, they've got different issues. They require different responses from their law enforcement and their first responders. I mean, one area may have issues with regards to drugs, other with regards to gang activity. You may have another neighborhood that is experiencing burglaries, car prowls. I mean, the issues vary from neighborhood to neighborhood, <clears throat> and for a sheriff, and I know that my partner's sitting next to me, it's how we adjust to meet your needs and what our responsibilities are. And then, of course, the Sheriff's Office has got other vast resources. We provide all civil process, all court orders. We have our corrections side of, side of the house. We have our work crews that come out and they support cleanups. And then, of course, we've got our partnerships with our, the federal agencies that come out and they support us out here when we're doing our enforcement functions out here. And that's just to name a few. Want me to get started? Hi, my name is Ken Johnson. I'm the police chief for the city of Fairview. I thought I'd take just a couple of minutes, one, to say thank you for inviting us and to talk a little bit about the structure of the Fairview Police Department because it's grown considerably in the last 10 years. So currently there are 15 commissioned police officers in the city of Fairview. That's a chief, three sergeants, one detective, a school resource officer, and then we have an officer assigned to the East Metro Gang Enforcement Team that we all partner with. We have five reserves, two uh, records clerks that are full-time record specialists, and a full-time cha or a volunteer chaplain that um, volunteers almost full time. So that's the structure of the department. I thought I'd touch on just a couple of issues this morning or this afternoon. One being a photo red light. I think we're the only agency in East County that currently has the photo video red light system at Fairview Parkway and Halsey. I wanted to stress the importance, also called the intersection safety program. Uh, the effectiveness and the impact that that one particular intersection has had. We went live in June of 2012, I believe, May of 2012 with a 30-day warning period. Our first full month of issuing citations was in July of 2012. At that time, we issued 259 citations for running that red light. At the end of January of this year, 2013, we issued 141 citations. So I'm proud to tell you that we've had an impact at that, at that intersection through public education and driver education of reducing red light violations there by almost 46%. What I think is more important, though, is when we were evaluating whether to place that at that intersection, that red light system, we had a number of, of accidents there in a five-year period of time 
resulting in 67% injuries for the accidents there. Since the camera's been live, there have been three minor accidents there resulting in zero injuries. So that to me is probably the most important factor of that red light system. Um, it is somewhat controversial, but it has truly made an impact and made the, that intersection safer, I believe, and has changed a lot of drivers' behavior, making them safer drivers wherever they go. I was asked to touch a little bit more on the regional and statewide issues. Um, I just concluded my presidency with the Oregon Association Chiefs of Police. During that term, I was approached by Representative Gorsick, who asked me, do you have any top priorities that you would like to have introduced into the legislative session in 13? Because they're allowed, I think, three high priority, top priority bills. We bantered around a little bit, and I said, one of the issues that I'm concerned about is school safety, specifically school zones. And uh, that I thought the, the existing photo radar law in this state had some problems with it and that I thought with the new advancement in technology and the video technology and so forth that if we could place the photo radar with video capability in school zones and eliminating the need to have a police officer present we could have a significant impact on the safety of our children at schools. He liked the idea, introduced a bill. Uh, the bill was to allow photo radar in school zones only, only during the hours of school statewide. It sailed through the House of Representatives and passed faster than and most bills I've ever seen. Hit the Senate, went to the Business and Transportation Committee, where it stalled. Final result was, and I think that it was again just because I happened to be the president of the association at the time, they offered Fairview to a, become a pilot project for a couple of years, we thought, to evaluate the system, put it in, conduct a, a bunch of studies and then report back to the legislature on uh, the effectiveness of that program. At one point, we, I mean, we pushed for a statewide system. I didn't think it was fair that only one city uh, represented the entire state on the pilot project, but it became clear to us that if we didn't accept that compromise, the bill would die. So long story short, the bill passed. Um, I went back to Representative Gorsuch and said, one year isn't long enough. School's only nine months long. It's going to take us a long time to implement. Uh, the program, uh, we added two components that are required for this bill. The, if you use photo radar in a school zone, it must have flashing yellow lights and it must have a sign that displays what your speed is. So it'll say your speed is, and it'll show you that plus the flashing yellow lights. If you're still blasting through a school zone, uh, you're probably going to get a ticket if you go through that particular school zone. That bill ultimately passed. Uh, we're working with the Fairview City Council right now to see if we can implement that by school year September 2014. It will most likely be on Halsey Street uh, in front of Reynolds Middle School and the Reynolds uh, Alternative High School. And that's also where the administrative, uh, administrative office is housed for Reynolds School District. So we're excited about that. Um, I will tell you that although it's not part of the bill, I've added three components that we're going to require and, and we've already started the process. We will conduct a speed study on what that current school zone ex as it exists now because it does not have flashing yellow lights. That's been, that's been done and uh, we found that in one particular, we, in two different days, two different weeks apart, there were almost 1,100 cars doing eight or more miles an hour over the speed limit in the school zone during school hours. So there's a significant need there. So now what we're going to do is we'll do a couple more speed studies while school's in session without the yellow lights then once the council approves it, we'll add the flashing yellow lights and the your speed is sign. Uh, the vendor that we're working with has agreed to pay all of those costs uh, and all of the costs for the equipment. So the city of Fairview uh, invests nothing as far as cash into this program. Then I'll d conduct another speed study after the flashing yellow lights go live to see what the impact is of the flashing yellow lights alone. Then after uh, September, we'll do a 30-day warning period, and then we'll implement with uh, live citations, and we'll see what kind of an impact that we have. It very well may be that I go back to the legislature and say, you know, just by putting flashing yellow lights in and your speed is signed, this, you can have a 75% reduction in speeding alone. Let's hope that, uh, that we have some kind of results like that. So it's exciting. We also hope that after a year or two of a pilot project, uh, we hope that it's very successful, that we can go back to the legislature and uh, encourage them to expand it to other jurisdictions in the state. Finally, you may have also uh, seen in the news lately, 
speaking about sex offender registration and that uh, the city of Fairview had a disproportionate amount, 259 uh, individuals registered as sex offenders in 2013, 13 of them lived in our city. So I was speaking at an event similar to this uh, the other day complaining about that and sex offender laws in general uh, that are broken in my opinion. Senator Lori Monis Anderson overheard me. She introduced a bill this last special session uh, to change the sex offender laws in Oregon to require that, that offenders register within the city that they reside. Now that th it went to a, a hearing. They actually amended the bill to create a work group to study the more comprehensive, the complex issue of sex offender laws uh, entirely in the state because there's a number of problems. That bill died in committee. So I'm not sure what the future uh, holds for sex offender registration laws. I can tell you there are a number of problems with them. Uh, we were requiring proof of address when people registered and uh, the state told us that we weren't allowed to do that that we're required to go out and, and follow up with them in the field. Well, that's double the resources right there. So we think there are some fixes to the sex offender law. For example, if you're just changing your address, do you really need to come into the police department? If we can't require proof anyway, isn't there an online version maybe or something like that that we could implement? So there's a lot of discussion around sex offender registration. Uh, hopefully in the next session, uh, we'll have an opportunity to address those again. Thank you. Well, good afternoon. I'm Scott Anderson, Troutdale Police Chief. I want to thank the League of Women's Voters for inviting us to be here today. I'd um, like to give you a quick snapshot of what's exciting and happening in, in Troutdale, a uh, city of, of uh, 16,000 people, about five square miles, and we have a complement of 27 full-time equivalent uh, folks in Troutdale. Uh, I'm excited about the Public Safety Advisory Committee. Uh, the committee for the past 18 months has been working on a strategic plan for the department. Uh, I'm glad to be able to tell you today that the City Council in Troutdale adopted that strategic plan uh, in August of last year. Uh, the plan is uh, pretty much a roadmap for where we're going, what we want to achieve. Uh, the folks in Troutdale have very high expectations of the police department and we aim to meet those expectations. You'll see everything from our performance and conduct expectations to the goals and strategies um, that are going to take us closer to that vision of reducing crime and the fear of crime in our community. So kudos to the Public Safety Advisory Committee for the hard work that they did to make that happen. It really does reflect uh, what our community expects of us. Also, um, within the Troutdale Police Department, we continue to do a lot of the programs that are aimed at engaging with the community. Uh, we appreciate the community support that we got and continue to get. In 2010, uh, we are so grateful that the community came together and voted for us to be, be able to build a new police station. And in 2012, we completed a 23,000 square foot facility that currently houses us and uh, really adds to the functionality of the police department. We had a very, very small, inadequate uh, facility before the people saw that we needed something else. It allows us to actually deliver uh, better services to the citizens of, of Troutdale. Uh, we continue with programs such as the Gang Resistance Education and Training Program at Walt Morey Middle School. We have two uh, school resource officers at Reynolds, one of them works part-time in the, in the grade schools and the middle school. Uh, we all share responsibilities for East Metro Gang Enforcement Team, uh, which is the, uh, the law enforcement component, the arrest and uh, so forth, and we, and we do that together. Uh, this is a prevention program. We want to reach the kids at a younger age, and that's what the Gang Resistance Education and Training uh, Program does. Uh, the, the focus is to teach kids how to make responsible decisions. We also have, uh, in our new facility, we're fortunate to have a drug take-back uh, box, which we all have at our, at our uh, uh, police departments. It's an opportunity for people to get rid of old prescription medication free. All you do is bring it into the lobby and, uh, and we'll, we'll take the drugs back and have it properly disposed. That's for anything that's unwanted or anything that's uh, expired medications. So we have a safe uh, disposal plan for that. Uh, sex trafficking is a big issue that we all share. And in Troutdale, as you know, we have two truck stops down on Frontage Road, uh, which is a, 
an, an area where we watch closely and work with the sheriff's office and with Gresham and with Fairview when we need to get together and do missions and so forth. But that's an, uh, that has been a long-standing issue that hasn't really um, uh, been met with a lot of uh, different, different um, enforcement tactics, but we're aware of that problem. It's definitely here. It's not just an issue that is in other nations. Um, it's right here, and we're, we're well aware of that. Um, by way of community involvement, I also want to let you know that uh, I'm very proud of the Multnomah County Sheriff's Office and the Troutdale Police Department coming together every single year during the Christmas season to have a toy drive down at the Walmart in Wood Village. Um, this past year, we collected over 204 bags of toys for the kids in East Multnomah County. We delivered those down to um, Snowcap, who distributed those toys to the kids during the holiday season. We also very appreciate the, the uh, Oregon Special Olympics, uh, and we support the Special Olympics. Last year, the Troutdale Police Department raised over $37,000 for Oregon Special Olympics. The uh, different methods for that is the, uh, the wonderful uh, polar plunge in the Columbia River, which will wake you up in February, uh, and uh, also the tip of cop uh, and the torch run. So we're, we appreciate the support that we get from our citizens in Troutdale, from our city council, and uh, we feel that we need to be engaged with the community to meet those expectations, and we will continue to, to try to do so. Well, good afternoon. My name's Craig Jenniger. I'm the police chief here in Gresham. <clears throat> Thank you for giving me an opportunity to come and talk about two things I'm passionate about. One is my police department, and two is the city of Gresham. So I wanted to talk about a few items that uh, we're doing as a police department to better serve our city. One, 10 years ago, the citizens of Rockwood voted to pass a, a bond for urban renewal. Part of that bond was that a new police facility would be built in the, the Rockwood neighborhood. So I'm pleased to say that in November, we opened a 12,000 foot uh, facility on 181st that now serves our property and evidence, our gang unit, our traffic unit, and we have a neighborhood district attorney in there, compliments of the district attorney's office. So what we're doing is creating more high presence and visibility of, of law enforcement in the Rockwood neighborhood. I might also add that uh, it doesn't happen very often, but we completed the building on time and under budget. So I'm really proud of that. And if you haven't seen it, we have a really nice facility down there. One of the next things I wanted to touch about or touch on is that if you've been a resident of Gresham for any time, you've seen that our, our community is changing. Part of that change is the gang activity that has uh, come in from North and Northeast Portland. And a lot of that has to do with the gentrification of uh, that area. People that are on subsidized housing can find uh, cheaper rents and cheaper apartments out in the Rockwood area. So it's no secret that over the last few years we've seen a rise in gang activity and we've seen a rise in gang violence. So to me that's concerning, one as a resident that lives here, but two also as the, the person that has the ultimate responsibility of protecting this community. So there's several things that uh, we've done over this, this past few months now. Addressing gang activity is a three-prong approach. You have suppression, intervention, and prevention. So we do a very good job with our limited resources on suppression. And that's done with the East Metro Gang Enforcement Team, of which all of my partners here at the table have members in that unit. It's a six officer deputy unit with a sergeant that their job is to go out and deal with with gang activity identify the gang members arrest them if they're committing criminal offenses and do the suppression aspect what we haven't done well enough over the last couple of years is deal with the intervention and prevention a key to stopping generational gang activity is to identify those families that are gang affected and dealing with the youth before they get a chance to enter the gangs. So what we've done, about six months ago, I hired a gang outreach worker. 
And that out, out, gang outreach worker has a caseload of uh, youth that are submitted by our gang unit and our officers in all the communities that deal with them on a daily basis and have realized that there's certain families that are becoming gang affected for one reason or another. So this gang outreach worker goes out, contacts the family, starts counseling, offering services, lets them know what's available, and the, the target is to keep that 12-year-old kid from joining one of the gangs in the city. So I'm glad the council, the city manager supported that. Uh, that was a, a big one for us to get. The second thing we've done is uh, Multnomah County right now is in the process of doing a comprehensive gang assessment for the entire county. So we wanted to be a little bit ahead of that and we hired or uh, did a position for a gang prevention policy advisor. And what this person is doing is looking at a comprehensive gang strategy for the city of Rock, uh, Gresham, which includes where most of our gang activity is in the city of, uh, or the part of the city of Rockwood. So what he's gonna be dealing with is pretty much looking at how do we get the community involved with services available to prevent and get the intervention part of gang activity. So to me, that's very forward looking on our city's part and I think, I hope it's gonna be successful. I wanna grow that program with a couple more outreach workers and once we get our strategy designed, it'll probably incorporate all of our cities that will be partners in, in this gang strategy. One of the other things I wanted to touch on is in this next year's budget, I've uh, ask for two additional officers and what those officers I plan to use them for is a neighborhood livability officer and what they will have is direct contacts with our neighborhood associations. You know we do a very good job of responding to calls for service on the reactive side. What we don't do a good enough job of is dealing with proactive issues that are in neighborhoods. And we all know we have the crime issues, the burglary issues, the robbery issues, the same as every community does. But what we don't have enough time and resources to deal with is that nuisance property down at the end of your street. And every neighborhood has one. They're either dealing drugs, they're having parties, the kids are racing up and down the street. Those kind of things that, de that affect your quality of life in your neighborhood. So these two officers, their primary focus will be contact, a liaison with the neighborhood associations, and they will be dealing directly with issues in your individual neighborhood. So I'm real excited about that. The last thing I want to talk about is, uh, the sheriff touched on it with the program they have, but when I came up here five years ago, it's hard to believe it's been that long already, but I started what's called the Citizen Volunteers in Policing. And what I found was there was a lot of committed individuals in our city that didn't have a way to connect and devote time to our city. So I started this program and they're not police officers, they aren't going out handling calls. What they are is ambassadors for our police department. They'll go out, they'll engage the community, high visibility, and they'll drive through the parks, They'll go uh, locate graffiti in the city. They're now delivering uh, boxes of food to the homeless. I mean, it's, it's almost endless what these volunteers will do. They, some of them are working 40 hours a week as a volunteer now. One of the things we did last year, we bought a multi-purpose uh, vehicle to use on the Springwater Trail. And I painted it up like a police car. It's got a light bar and everything. And that can now be seen driven by our volunteers on Springwater Trail to make sure that the people that use the trail feel a sense of safety by seeing some kind of law enforcement presence on the trail. So we have a lot of things going to try to address the, the changes in our community. And you know we have a very supportive council and we have a public safety levy coming up uh, on the May ballot. Uh, you can get on our website and find out all the information about that. So thank you. I'm impressed that you covered so much in a, in a relatively short period of time. So we do have time for questions. And 
Christina is going to handle that aspect. And I, I know we always have questions. I'm saving mine to last. <laughs> Might take a few minutes, so would someone like to begin? And I'll, I'll let her handle that microphone. A couple of you have mentioned the demographic change, increasing diversity in East County. And it has brought problems that you have had to deal with. I'm wondering if in your hiring practices you have changed to encourage the application or hiring of, of a more diverse population among officers. Well, I'll start just briefly. Uh, several years ago, we looked at our, our hiring practices and, and how we were doing them and how we were recruiting people. And I believe that a police department should be representative of the community they police. So right now, unfortunately, we don't have a lot of diversity African American in our, our police department. We don't have a lot of Hispanics, and we obviously don't have a lot of females. So one of the things that we've done with our hiring practices over the last several years has vetted for certain things. One is diversity, one is uh, gender, and then we look at other things too. Education, is there military background, some of those things that we believe make a good police officer. So what we're really working on now, and we're attending job fairs, we're attending military events, everything, but our focus right now is on diversity and gender because we need to make our police department more representative of our community. I guess I'll take the next shot. Uh, <clears throat> one of the advantages of having school resource officers and we all do in the, in the high school and in the uh, middle school, is that we interact with those kids. And um, obviously the makeup of the school is changing just like general society is changing. So we have an opportunity there to engage with some of those folks at an early age. And when they show uh, an interest in either uh, law enforcement or military or whatever it might be, uh, our school resource officers are equipped and skilled to talk to them about their future and what they need to do. That's, that's the lead in to say how important an education is. So stay in school. Um, there are all kinds of programs that folks can get involved in and they, it's just a lack of knowledge and we need to bridge that gap so that they know what is available to them and what to do. There are cadet programs they can get involved in. There are reserve officer programs that they can get involved in. And uh, we truly do want to, to attract uh, the folks to make our, our departments more diverse. And it's, it's one of those things that you just don't start with a program and it's something that has, it takes a lot of work, it takes a lot of focus, and it has to be sustained. Any other comments? Well, I'll, I'll add ours. <clears throat> The, the sheriff's office is very diverse. Uh, matter of fact, I'm very proud of what we've done over the years. We've got uh, some very highly educated people. Matter of fact, I feel uh, that I'm not smart enough anymore to, to match the education level of some of the people that we're bringing in. Uh, we've got, uh, on the law enforcement side, uh, they're all call, they've all got bachelor's degrees or higher levels of education. We're now bringing in a lot of people with PhDs. They speak multiple languages. Uh, we've got a vast array. Matter of fact, uh, uh, the last set of employees that I hired, uh, they speak Russian. Uh, some of them speak German. So they've got, they've got a lot of that. And then we've got some that sp speak some of the Pacific Island dialects. Um, so we're very proud of that and, and we, we we integrate this into what we're doing both in our jail setting and on the law enforcement side. And then of course, uh, one of the responsibilities that I have as sheriff, and I represent all of the sheriffs in the state of Oregon, is I act for consul affairs for all of the consulates that are based here in Oregon. And I have a, a very good rapport and so we're able to identify some of the problems that exist, language barriers, uh, cultural barriers, and we address this uh, quite frequently. 
I know that both of my chief deputies in law enforcement and in corrections, uh, they interact and they make sure that that type of training is given to both our law enforcement and corrections staff. So I'm very proud of what we've managed to accomplish over the last four or five years now. Um, but I hope that answers your question. I think the resources available to, to all of our partners, um, we have those resources now, which we didn't have before. So I hope that answers your question. First of all, I, I, first of <laughs> first of all, I'd like to thank all of you for the information we've gotten. We just don't hear enough about what you do, and the community really needs to hear a whole lot more of wh what you're doing to to help the community, because it's a lot. But people don't know it; they grumble, but they really don't know what's there. Uh, in response to your hiring of police officers and the education. I want to know what the opportunities are for some of the military that instead of going to college, they join the, the military. They've been serving for years. Um, what's the opportunity for them? We have some great leaders in the military. Oh, you know, in our hiring practices, we've got that outlined as to how we interact and how we do the hiring practices. We work very well with the Veterans Affairs offices. Um, when I sit back, because I get a report on it quite frequently, I look at the number of veterans that we have in the agency. And right now, we're pretty close to about 35 to 40 percent of our employees, of, of, of an employee base of about 800, that are military veterans from either the Marine Corps, Navy, Air Force, and so forth. So we're very proud of, of what we're bringing in on that side of it. We're still trying to enhance it. We try to make sure that we've got the opportunities in place. One of the things that my command team is addressing and I'm addressing is uh, the disabled veterans and what it is that we can do internally to make sure that we are impacting that segment of our society and bringing them in to the sheriff's office as well. And I think we've got some very good plans that are working in that direction. We've already tapped into that particular resource with regards to our veterans. But it's not enough. I can tell you that now. It's not enough uh, when, you, when you are talking about veterans. To add on to that, uh, one, I'm proud to say that I'm an Army veteran. I served for three years full time. Uh, we recognize and honor our veterans and the state of Oregon a couple of years ago uh, changed the law that impacted public se sector and uh, there's now a veterans preference applied uh, to people that, that uh, test for police departments and corrections. So and I can't remember if it's five or ten percent it depends on uh, what they're applying for but we do have to apply a veterans preference for them and I'll be honest with you when I was hired by Longview Police Department in 1979 that helped me uh, obtain the job because there was a veteran's preference back then as well. So it's a good program. One of the things they've done in, the, in Gresham and you know we're very proud that like the Sheriff's Department about 30 percent of my my personnel are either have been military or currently uh, military and what the city of Gresham has done uh, several years ago when we started seeing a lot of our city employees being deployed was they passed a resolution that the city of Gresham will make up the difference between the pay received in the military and the pay they were receiving as a city employee. So when I have an officer deployed, which I have one beginning next week that's gonna be deployed for almost a year, his family won't suffer from that deployment. They will get their full salary and benefits from the city of Gresham. So I think that was, it was really a, a great thing that the city council did to show their support of the the veterans thank you all i would just like to add a question to that being a baby boomer myself and my husband recently retiring what is retirements looking like in your departments how how is that beginning to take shape well, I think we can all address it, so I'll, I'll address it first. Uh, our police department, when 
The city of Gresham annexed the Rockwood area, hired 25 new police officers almost overnight. So that was 1987. So the way the Oregon retirement system is set up, at 25 years and 50 years of age, you can retire. Well, I have hit those 25 police officers over the last couple of years. So we have had a tremendous amount of retirements uh, over the last several years. Now, the advantage of, you know, if there could be an advantage of the decline in the economy the last few years or the last five years is that it has kept some of my more seasoned officers from retiring. So I've been fortunate to be able to keep some of my long tenured officers. But, you know, with all of our agencies, there is turnover because of retirements. And probably about 40% of my police department right now is five years or younger in experience. So it's nice to be able to keep some of those uh, more veteran officers. But what people don't realize is when you have, because now a lot of the baby boomers are starting to retire, is what we call in law enforcement the brain drain, that all of these seasoned veteran officers with all of, all of this experience are walking out of our door and taking all of that institutional knowledge and all of their experience that they can give to the younger officers, it's walking out the door. So we've been severely impacted the last couple of years with retirements. If you're looking at the sheriff's office, we've suffered with this issue for quite some time. <clears throat> and that's simply because of how uh, things have been constructed for the sheriff's office when you're talking about one facility being built and then another facility such as our minimum security jail and our maximum security jail and we hire bulks at one particular time right now this is one of the issues that i suffer with and it it it, it basically falls back as inappropriate succession planning over the years going back long before my time knowing that these issues were going to come up right now if we started looking at it i'm losing staff on a consistent basis month by month. Uh, within the next three to five years, we'll lose about 90. Well, that's a huge impact to us based on what we've already lost, what we've got to tr try to hire. And then of course, it's the expense that we all incur as taxpayers because we have to train. And when we train an officer or we train a corrections deputy or a law enforcement deputy, you're looking at an expense of anywhere between twelve and fifteen thousand dollars straight out when you hire that employee and then it's the the probationary period to make sure that they they meet the standards to perform the, the tasks that we as one for me as an elected official and the chiefs when you're looking at your departments what our expectation is on how they need to serve the public and then of course it's like the chief said uh, we lose seasoned people and when we're losing the seasoned people, the, the dynamics of public safety are consistently changing right now. What I did when I was a law enforcement deputy versus what our deputies and our officers are currently doing, it's completely different. The laws were different 20 years ago or 15 years ago or even 10 years ago. And then, of course, it's the dynamics of the community that you're dealing with. In, in the, initially, all of us sitting here at the table when we were looking at East Multnomah County and what we were serving out here, we had specific cultural base that we were dealing with. Well, now that's vast in what we're seeing, so it's become very complex as to who we hire, how we hire, and then, of course, the standards that the state puts on us based on who it is that we're looking at and meeting the state standards. And for me, and I don't know about the other chiefs, that, that's very difficult to get through is the psychological exams. They have changed so significantly from when I was hired to currently. I mean, and I'll make a little bit of a joke about this. I'm sure that if the four of us went back and took a psych exam right now, we, none of us would probably pass now. <laughs> <laughs> but... Uh, these are the dynamics and the difficulties that we're facing with regards to hiring. We've got, we hire large segments at one given time and they leave, it, and what they're getting retirement-wise. 
uh, the PERS retirements, how it's established. They look at, at what the medical is going to be like or what percentage of medical they'll get at the time they retire. So, and realistically, law enforcement, public safety here in this state, and first responders, uh, including our teachers, they've got, we've all got very good retirement programs in place. So, when you're looking at retiring, when the time is right, everybody's leaving. Our situation's a little bit different because of the size of the department, but if you think of it <clears throat> in percentages, it's, uh, it's just as important uh, to say that in the next three to five years, we'll probably have three to five people who are eligible to retire. may not sound like much, but when you have, like myself, I'm a veteran, but we have two current military officers um, who can be called up at any time. So if they leave and we have two or three retirements, in a department that has 27 total, that's a huge percentage. So um, we're always trying to anticipate, but again, like Chief Juniger said, uh, the economics over the last few years have changed people's minds and people that may have decided to go are staying a little bit longer. Um, so it, it just depends on the dynamics of the people in the organization. I just wanted to dovetail to the impact of retirement or someone leaving for whatever reason the complexities of law enforcement, as, as you touched on, have grown so much that it, it could take from, especially in an agency of mine, where one person leaving is crippling. So we find out we have an opening, especially if it's fairly suddenly, it takes maybe three months to hire, backfill, psychological, background investigations. You bring them on board, you have an orientation period, the academy 16 weeks and then you have at least a 16 plus week field training program. So you, it can take six to eight months, nine months before you start to receive any kind of, of return on your investment for an employee. And during that time, uh, you're suffering with that vacancy uh, because now they're teamed up with a field training officer or they're in the academy. Anybody that's been reading the paper in East County knows that Fairview has, has had some difficulties the last couple of years uh, with some officer involved shootings and some other violent incidents that you know statistics are overwhelming that that's a lot for a small agency in a short period of time coupled with that we've had three cancer scares in our agency and two officers were out at the same time for cancer treatment and so we were struggling for a long time we're just now getting all of our folks back and healed one ended up retiring and he has been replaced and we have an officer in the academy right now uh, with that replacement so I'm speaking, I mean, real time, uh, we're suffering from that now, and it'll be at least four, five, six more months before we'll see that officer on his own uh, and, and serving us. Thank you for coming today. I want to ask a question uh, specifically about traffic control. I want to take you back to traffic control for a minute and uh, maybe more generally about some of the other issues you've talked on uh, today. Uh, the question that I have is that, uh, it, first a statement, it, it, it appears to me to be uh, traffic control is like a balloon. If you, if you push one side of a balloon or one intersection of a street and, and drive down the traffic, uh, uh, problems in that particular street are are is the balloon just uh, staying the same size only it's growing in a different direction are you moving the traffic patterns to other places and if so are you able to measure those things um, is there a process in place where on a, at least a Multnomah County level uh, uh, traffic data and uh, engineering uh, 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 aspects of, of crashes uh, and those kinds of things are measured and and just I'm glad you're ready to jump in there sir uh, but uh, one more thing with regard to some of the other issues uh, filling in vacancies in a very small police force is there a regional opportunity there for uh, for temporary uh, assignment uh, for, of, a, of another police f um, uh, department or the sheriff's department uh, to help fill in those, those uh, crises? I'll touch on it and then I'm... Let's start with the traffic issue. <clears throat> all, all four of us sitting up here have uh, planning and research units. 
Those planning and research units collect the data based on both calls and then based on the citations issued and other data that they collect with regards to traffic control. We never fix on one particular area. We will then rotate based on the changes because it's a, the, traffic, the traffic flows change based on whatever the movement is between East County to West County. And, and the access routes that are available. So we're constantly readjusting to make sure that we meet those traffic needs, especially around the schools. Uh, the other end of it is, is that when you start looking at filling gaps, <clears throat> I think we've all touched on that. Uh, I've got a res uh, volunteer reserves that are trained. Uh, they go out and they support law enforcement all, for all of us. I mean, we all have reserve units and they, and we, they cross interconnect with all of the agencies supporting the officers and the deputies that are actually working out there. And then we also have, just as the chief has said, it, we also have in place our citizens that come in that volunteer and they are, they are our ambassadors. They go out, they look at what the crimes are like, they talk to the business owners, they talk to, the to people living in the neighborhoods uh, and they report back to, for us, it's the deputy that, that is responsible for that end of it, which ends up going to the chief. We have law enforcement that then readjusts, targets certain areas, or they've actually interceded because of what they've been able to identify as a crime. And, and I'm pretty sure the chief will probably elaborate on it, but that's the same thing that, uh, that I know that Gresham has. I've seen them driving around in their cars. They're there to protect the citizens and keep the law enforcement that's actually out there responding to the calls and dealing with the issues, keeping them informed so that we can respond appropriately. So they, in my mind, they're filling our gaps for what we can't provide with, with our paid law enforcement employees that are trained and certified. In Gresham, we have, you know, as the Sheriff's Department and the other departments, you know, a specialized traffic unit and the purpose of that unit is to facilitate safe flow of traffic through our city. So one of the things they're tasked with is looking at that data. Um, accidents at intersections, what's the primary cause of that accident? And then what we do is modify our deployment of resources based upon that data that we get. If we're having a lot of accidents at you know, a specific intersection, that's where we'll focus some of our resources. And unfortunately, it's a term in police work that we call displacement. That if you heavily enforce a certain area, the people are gonna go somewhere else. So we can go heavily enforce one area for the red turn, the left turn violations and that kind of stuff. Well, they're gonna realize that officers are working that intersection. They're gonna go three blocks down and use that left turn and run that red light. So unfortunately, it's like the sheriff said, we try to stay one step ahead of them and never let them know where we're gonna be tomorrow. <laughs> but, you know, unfortunately, that's what we have. As far as your second comment, if we could figure out how to do that amongst all of our law enforcement agencies, I think we would all support some way that we could call up a 1-800 number and say, hey, I need two officers tomorrow but I just don't see based upon contractual issues, mandated training and all of that stuff that we'd be able to make it work. It's a great idea though. I, anecdotally, I have spoken to a number of people in the courtroom uh, that have received photo red light tickets, for example, and we have heard consistently and the judge has, has given me this information as well, a majority of the people say, you know what, I'm a safer driver now. I make sure I come to a complete stop. I now recognize, especially when they see the video, that they're so focused on looking left, they're not looking at the bike lane and the pedestrians and the bus stop that sits at that intersection. And so anecdotally, we've had a lot of people say, I'm a safer driver, and it's made me a safer driver wherever I travel, not just at that intersection. And I love the comment that we heard the judge say the other day, because there was somebody up there arguing, saying, you know, I looked, and it was okay, so I went. Even though I, you know, I ran a red light and turned right without stopping, the judge's answer was, you know, in all my years of practice and being a judge, I have never heard anybody say that's had an accident. I looked, I saw the car coming, and I went anyway. So 
I believe it does make, uh, traffic enforcement does work and I think it does make us, our, tra our highway safer. I appreciate <clears throat> your comment and your question. And that, uh, from Troutdale's standpoint, uh, we have a couple of our major roads. One is 257th, which is a county road, and also Columbia River Highway down in the downtown area, which is a Multnomah County road as well. Environmentally, we work with the county very closely in the road department to see if there are environmental changes that we can make. In fact, uh, this past spring, I held a chief's forum on the topic of traffic safety because traffic safety and drugs seem to be the two top things on people's minds when, whenever we survey people and ask, what do you want us to do? And so we look at those. Uh, we ended up, even though it's a business district down on the Columbia River Highway, and by ORS, by the statute, it's 20 miles per hour, it wasn't, there was no signage. So people were going faster and it's getting more congested with pedestrian traffic. So we went through the county, they went to the state, we got the signs down there, um, and, and that's the kind of thing we wanna do. Uh, rather than throwing police officers at it that we don't have, it's nice to have an environmental change that will change what drivers do, um, so that's working. Now we have to work on the U-turns. <laughs> um, I, I, this may be an old question, but yet it's current uh, with the, again, potential legalization of marijuana. What, I, I don't know if I want to ask your personal opinions or whether I should ask what the potential impact there might be in your communities, whether it's grow houses or increases of crime or what? Can, can I maybe, because I've been involved in this on the state level as well. I went to a conference in January believing, and, and actually as I said on the board of the Chiefs Association, I sent an email out to the board and the legislative committee saying, you know what, let's get in front of this thing. It's gonna become legal. Let's try to get in front of it and, and do whatever we can to minimize the impact. And then I went down and I heard um, the drug czar for the, for the United States. I, his name escapes me right now. You remember the guy I'm talking about? Anyway, he's, he's President Obama's on down, I think, to Bill Clinton. And after I heard him speak, I walked out of there absolutely convinced that legalization would be a mistake for a number of reasons. And I think the best one is, I'm not sure I buy that it's medicine, but we won't go there. Even if you, you buy the concept that it's medicine, pharmaceutical products are regulated at the manufacturer level. Marijuana is not. It's not regulated. You don't know what you're getting when you buy it. Um, and you can hear the twists and the turns of the information that came out about it. And we have far too long today to talk about it. But one of them is uh, the Epileptic Foundation. You'll, you'll hear that the Epileptic Foundation, or whatever they're called, has uh, endorsed legalizing marijuana because it's medicine for epileptic patients. What they left out of that conversation was that the particular marijuana that's being used for that has all the THC removed. So all of the product that makes you high, it's the other components of the marijuana that's helping the patients. Well, they don't tell you that. Uh, the other thing that he spoke about was the potency. The marijuana today is far more potent, like 100 times more potent than it was 20 years ago. And so you can't compare the dosage of today to the dosage of 20 years ago. And there's just a whole bunch of factors. I can tell you that our state association helped negotiate a bill that was just finally, we were, the bill was dead in the legislature to help local governments regulate where dispensaries can take place. They've allowed cities that pass an ordinance to put a moratorium on that until May of 2015, while a work group works through this issue and tries to come up with something that's gonna be more palatable. So at least if, and I know Fairview's looking at that right now, and I think the other jurisdictions are as well, to put that moratorium in place to allow government uh, to try and deal with this. I'll give you a great example. It's all of us in, in a problem. It's against federal law to possess marijuana. And so I'll give you a great example. We had some marijuana that came in the other day into the evidence room. And then somebody comes in whipping their mar medical marijuana card out and saying, give me my marijuana back. That puts me in one heck of a conflict because if I do give them their marijuana back, I'm a dealer. I've just committed a felony under federal law 
by giving them the marijuana back. So it really places us in a tough spot until they get the laws straightened out between the state and the federal. One of the biggest things that we're dealing with in our community are the grow houses. And it's one of the biggest complaints I get from people in our neighborhoods. Unfortunately, the OMMA, Oregon Medical Marijuana Act, has so many loopholes in them, you could drive semi-trucks through them. So, you know, the concept may be good. You know, you want a personal opinion? No, I don't believe it should be legalized. However, as a police chief, I have to look forward and say, okay, if it's legalized, how do I deal with it? How do we zone it? How do we put restrictions on it at a local level so it doesn't disrupt the livability of our community? But the problem is that if you're a provider of uh, medical marijuana, you can have a certain number of plants, you can have a certain amount of finished product in your possession. Well, one of the big loopholes is there's nothing in the OMMA that says how many of those people can be at one location. So we're finding homes in the city of Gresham that have four or five people and each of them can grow for five people. So what we're finding is a lot of crime related to that because at any given time, if you're growing, if you have five people that can each grow for five people, there may be 25 pounds of finished product of marijuana in that residence. And that's worth a whole lot of money. So what we're finding is that people are breaking into homes, they're committing armed robberies of these homes that are the grow houses. So, you know, when you look at legalizing it, I think we need to look at truly what is going to be the effect on the younger generations of marijuana. You know, as the chief alluded to, the THC in marijuana right now is much, much more than it ever was when I was growing up. And that scares me because I am one of those people that believe the use of marijuana leads to other drugs. You asked for my personal opinion, so. I've only got one comment to add to this. It, setting aside what, what, what both chiefs have said, uh, right now if Oregon is going to move in the direction of trying to legalize marijuana, they've got the perfect opportunity to at least slow down and watch what's transpiring in the state of Washington and Colorado so that if we do lean in that direction, we can observe where they've run into their obstacles, both with the public safety side and then also with the health side. I mean, there's so many laws that intersect with what we're looking at with one, the dispensaries for medical marijuana, but then just the generalized legalization. And I think if we, if our legislature would take the time to just slow it down a little bit. We've come this far. If they slow down and they watch what problems exist in the other two states and we see what the loopholes are and we, and we can identify, if we go in that direction, we're not going to make the same mistakes or fall into the same pits, for lack of a better word, that, that they're seeing right now and the complications that they're facing. I mean, this covers everything from what we would look at with regards to how you would tax it or how it's going to grow, who's going to control how it's grown. And then you, and then re-looking at the laws because you've got tobacco laws that are in place and, and how that's going to intersect. And then looking at how enforcement's going to have to re restructure what it is they do because actually testing for for marijuana is completely different than doing a roadside test for for being under the influence of alcohol. And some of these things we just we're, we're not there yet. And if we're going to do this, we need to slow down and we need to take the time to do it. Colorado so, has experienced a significant right. increase in uh, emergency room visits by young children overdosing on marijuana because they're they're packaging it in brownies and candy and all these other things, the edible issue, the kids are getting their hands on and overdoses have skyrocketed. But this is a much broader, broader perspective than what, what the legislature is in a rush, the lobbyists are in a rush. <clears throat> we have an opportunity, law enforcement's got an opportunity, and I think law enforcement needs, and our first responders, need a, a larger voice in how you would construct a bill if you're going to push towards legalization and the dis dispensaries and, and establish the dispensaries. Uh, any other comments? 
I would like to add another question that pertains to this as well. Well, I would just say from our standpoint, too, it's not that we're not compassionate about these folks who have serious medical issues. You know, if we all have people that we know who've been impacted by cancer or glaucoma or something like that, and when the propaganda first started out to justify the use, you know, this is the targeted audience that was going to be needing medical marijuana, when in fact the table has swung so far the other way that if you go into a doctor and you have a backache, you can just about get, you know, allowed medical marijuana. So for those people who are suffering, is there going to be a reduction in the number of narcotic and opiate addicted folks because of medical marijuana? We'll see. But so far, from what I've seen, um, that audience that is, is getting the uh, medical marijuana or the, the, that is going to be getting that is so broad that um, I think it's, it's being misused. Are we over? We can go over the third okay. Okay. more time. I'm sorry. Okay. We have you here. <laughs> We've been <laughs> over. <laughs> I'm watching the clock. I'm enjoying the conversation. <laughs> I don't want to get yelled at. <laughs> questions. One of, one of the issues about the traffic in marijuana, Europe, especially Holland, has had uh, cafes, marijuana mm -hmm. cafes in place for years. They don't drive. They don't have the highway system that we have. They, they use bicycles in Holland. They use trams. They use trolleys. They use the train system. They don't use the vehicles like we do. Surely we need to consider that before we do a large-scale marijuana transition. Mm -hmm. But um, the other comment that I have, last night I, had, I attended a safety and justice uh, meeting, so I have information about the justice reinvestment in Multnomah County, and, and I realize that Chief Anderson is mm -hmm. part of that committee. Mm -hmm. To me, it seems like this can help us transition um, where the high costs that we're all talking about um, will help us in our communities mm -hmm. to transition some of the issues, the higher addiction rates that surely will follow. I'm concerned about dogs. My dog about five years ago had a, had a um, somebody somehow, <laughs> may, maybe not on purpose, um, through through uh, cocaine down, he was tested for cocaine. He went into convulsions, and, and I'm sorry, I'm a dog lover, uh, and, and I just see this out there for for children, and and what a danger this is. So surely we can slow down, and take our time to deal with this issue. But my question would be to you, Chief Anderson, to mm -hmm. start with. How do you see the Reinvestment Act um, well, impacting you're about us? 3194. Uh, I'm on the subcommittee for Justice Reinvestment um, with the Local Public Safety Coordinating Council. It's a very complex uh, issue, but in, in a summary format, uh, reinvesting dollars to save um, money uh, at, the, at the state level for prison beds is what this is all about. How can we do that? and maintain a safe uh, community. Um, the the uh, governor started this uh, a few years ago by saying the state of Oregon's budget is, is just out of control. We've got to get it back down to where it's manageable. Where are we going to be able to balance this budget? And of course, uh, uh, Sheriff Staten's been involved all along with this process because every county uh, is impacted by jail bed space and, and the prison, how we're going to continue uh, to keep the community safe. Um, it, it's a very, very complex issue. It, we're working through that right now. It's, um, there are going to be reductions in sentences. There are going to be, there's a criteria set for who would be eligible to have a reduction in the sentence and who would not be. Some that I think what the, the end result is going to be, it's going to depend on if we can actually provide the services that these people need to not uh, 
commit crimes continually. In other words, we're, we're going to have to see if, if housing is the issue or if mental health is the issue. How do we shift the money to where the person is going to be made whole and not reoffend? That's a huge issue because everybody's different. And uh, so we're, we're working on that issue here in Multnomah County, but all over the state as well. And it, it is, um, it, it's a tough one to crack because we're plowing new ground and it's gonna be very, very difficult to show uh, the results that we want to see, the outcomes that we want to have. But I think Sheriff is probably uh, versed in this as well to, to address. <clears throat> right now, I've, I've <clears throat> received an appointment for the governor. Uh, and I sit on uh, his uh, grant review committee for 3194. And I'll give you a summation. I, I, the chief's done a very good job of this. What's happened is, is that with 3194, we're trying to create a savings statewide on the public safety side for the redeployment of funds that'll be saved at the state level. What the governor has asked is he set a specific number of beds in the prison system that he wants to bring, bring the current population down to that set number and then look at how the sentencing comes in to make sure that either people that are sentenced can remain locally to serve their sentence or and only those that necessarily have to go to prison for specific crimes. So what they've been working on currently is that when 3194 was passed, $3.1 million came back to Multnomah County. That, those funds right now, we've got our judges, the district attorney, the sheriffs, the chiefs, parole and probation trying to determine how that money is going to be spread out to cover what the responsibilities will be for the county once these individuals that are serving their time in our state prisons are released and they come back to local control. So we're looking at the numbers coming back to local control. So what we look at is how when, and there's going to be ongoing funding that's going to come year after year, and that's part of what I sit on is developing the grants that the counties can apply for to get funding to support this and the number of people coming back. So what are we faced with and what are we looking at? And this is the discussion that's being had now at the local level where the chief is sitting is what kind of programs do we need? And what is it we'll need? Well, there's three categories that we've automatically looked at. You're going to have people that are going to be released from prison coming back here, and it's going to be a place to live, job placement, and medical care. Where are they going to get it? And how are they going to get it? So how do we reapply these funds to support these, these individuals coming back into the county? Because that's going to be the first thing that we need to look at. If we don't look at it and address it and apply the monies appropriately, these are going to be the individuals that are going to come back into the county and they're going to reoffend. And that's what we will all have to address. Because the key element is, is that the only way that you can send them back to prison is if they commit a new crime. If they come back here under, under the parole and probation guidelines, if they violate, they stay in a local jail which is expensive. I mean, you're paying for somebody to sit in a jo local jail for, for any violation that could occur. But then you've got to look at how these programs will be developed to address drug and alcohol issues, domestic violence issues. I mean, the list goes on because several of these individuals that, that are going down there that will subsequently be released have been dependent in those areas. And they'll fall back into those areas if we're not providing the right outlets and the right resources to them. So this is what 3194 is about. We want to create a savings for the state of Oregon at the prison level. However, we're going to have to absorb the problems here at the local level, and we've got to make sure our plans are in place so that law enforcement is not going out and addressing issues, parole and probation is not violating, and they're not ending up in our jail because we pay for the jail. The state doesn't pay for the jail. You and I do. So that's part of what this is all about, working on. This is a very complicated problem, especially when you're talking about the three issues I just mentioned. Finding a home, finding a job, and finding medical outlets for these people to, to reach out to, because that's what they're going to need. That's what we would need. That would be my first concern. 
and then it's going to be addressing any any substance issues or psychological issues or whatever issue that that we would need to have to develop programs that they would have to follow during the course of their release so this is what 3194 in a nutshell is so it's how do we how do we apply the grant monies that'll be coming in year after year and how to end how they're going to be written up to apply for those grants at the state level. And then the other is, is how we outlay the funds locally. Because we have to be very cautious. 3194 makes it very clear that money's coming back in. That goes to parole and probation. These people are going back to parole and probation. They will make the decisions as to what segments of that money will be peeled off to go to public safety or to go to the jail system. It's not going to be one of the chiefs here or myself going in and saying, well, I need this, this amount of money coming out. They're going to have to identify the problem, and this is going to be a long process. The hopes is, is that, we'll fit them, fit, that these folks will have the resources to fit back into our community and that they'll fit back in very nicely. But we have to be concerned that we're addressing their issues when they're coming out. How close are we to having something like that in place? Well, I can, I can talk about where we're at with that <coughs> specific committee. And, uh, there will be a pilot project that starts in July. And what that is, is the assessment process of the people who are coming through the system. We're trying to do a better job of assessing at the front end what services they might need to make, help them be successful. And uh, that's not an easy task. I mean, we, uh, sheriffs talked about housing, employment, uh, and, and also the mental health aspect. We have people currently in our jail, and we have people in prison who have huge mental health issues. Um, if you're able to help those people with those mental health issues, does that mean they're not going to recidivate? We don't know that until they get out. Uh, but th those are the kinds of complex issues that we're dealing with is human uh, interaction and human behavior and the dynamics that are involved are just huge but it's going to take a lot of effort to make sure that they get what they need to help them be successful or this just won't work any other comments about that topic i i just think that the citizens need to be prepared for this because it's very clear that public safety, our judicial process, our jail system, we're not prepared for this kind of, of a situation to develop. We're going to have to, do, to create a plan and we've got to work the plan. The district attorney's office has done a very good job to date because their percentage wise, the number of people that are coming out of Multnomah County going to prison is now down below <coughs> the bar that's been set by the governor. So some of the plans we've got in effect, they're, they're working out good, but this process has already started and we're behind the curve. I'd like to thank each of you for taking the time today to come and share this information with us because the community needs to be aware as you said, we, the community needs to be actively involved in how these changes that we're all addressing will take place in our communities about quality of life, the things that matter to us each and every day as we go around our neighborhoods. So we're going to wrap up here. I know that we touched on some very complex issues in just a little over an hour. <laughs> um, and we appreciate that very much. And um, we hope that the audience will stay in touch with their local community organizations that will continue to have information about these issues. And we'll wrap up with that today. Please like People for Parks. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm a Parks and Rec person. Did you know that? <laughs> and that's part of our answer, too. And we all know that. We're working on that too. <laughs> and uh, like League of Women Voters of East Multnomah County 
and our website. Christina has done an awesome job of putting that information together as we go forward to keep democracy alive and well for all of us. So thank you everyone today.